Hello church, welcome to worship today. We're glad to have you with us. It's going to be a great day. We are starting a series on personal finance and how God wants to set us free financially, something that all of us are longing for. That is true. As we begin our time of worship together, we invite you to, to leave some comments in the, the chats and, and places below wherever you're watching, and also invite someone to join you in watching the service. Uh, share what you're watching with others, and that way we can expand the, the reach of ministry of the church. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, church. It's great to be with you today on this glorious day. Here we go. I was buried in my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my dream. Oh, yeah. 
you want to find me that's what my father does Ooh. worship this morning comes from Psalm 126. You may follow along or join in as we read together. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go forth weeping, bearing the seed of sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Amen. Hi kids, I am so glad to get to worship with you all today. This week, I have been thinking a lot about work. What kind of work do you do? Did you know that every time you use your energy to do something or make something, you're doing work? Like when you listen and learn from your teacher, when you help your family do chores at home or help your neighbor with their yard, when you pick up trash at the park, that is work. Work is important to God. In the Bible, it tells us that in the very beginning, God was working. 
It tells us, too, that when he had finished creating the world and us, that he looked at all of that work, he said it was very good, and he rested from that work after that. So this week, I had a lot of fun asking some of my friends about what kind of very good work they wanted to do when they grow up. Listen to this poem and look and see what they told me. When you grow up. Someday soon, when you grow up, you'll have a job to do. You'll care for cattle at the ranch or work inside a zoo. You might want to be a superhero like your teacher who teaches you to read. You might be a Texas Ranger or plant a little seed. You might want to be a police officer. Helping people is what you will do. You might be a strong builder, or a super big sister, or sail the ocean blue. You might want to be a firefighter, a people saver. That's what you might be. If you put God and others first, if you're loving and caring, it will be very good work. You will see. And we can't wait to see what very good work God has planned for you. So you guys take care, and I cannot wait to be with you soon. God bless you. Bye-bye. Wasn't that great to see what the kids yeah, want to be fun. when they grow up? Very fun. Thank Beautiful. you to our day school kids and our church kids for that children's <laughs> lesson and to Miss Leanne. We come now to our time of prayer. Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer as we go before our God. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you for the gift of the dreams that you give us, uh, for what the children have shown us as they are thinking about their futures. Help us as your people also to think about the future and what you're calling us to do and, and who you're calling us to be. Lord, we thank you for this week that is behind us, for all the opportunities that we've had to, to serve and to share with others. We thank you for the ways that you have enriched our lives through friendships and conversations. Lord, for those who have had times of suffering and hurt, we ask your, your presence, your blessing, your peace, and your healing over all of those people in their situations. And if there is a way that we as a church can reach out to those who are hurting, Lord, continue to show us that we might be your hands and your feet here in this community and even around the world. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings of life. We thank you for your call, and we ask you to help us to be the people that you've called us to be. We lift our prayer in Christ's name. And together, even though we are separated by distance, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, I have been amazed at how much and how well our soccer fields, our athletic fields are getting used. If, if you've driven by the church, you know the morning, the evening, there's always folks from the community out there. And so uh, your pastor screwed up our courage and we went out to say hello. We're both a little bit of introverts. Uh, but we met some great teams. Two teams were practicing and we, the first one was the Angels. And they are a group of five and six-year-old boys that are playing t-ball. And they have two rings and they are undefeated for the season and on their way maybe to a third championship and they were so grateful church that we provide the space for free for these five and six year olds to practice every night it was a lot of fun we also met the sharks which is a a young ladies team a traveling team and they've played uh, all over south texas and soccer uh, soccer yes yeah. soccer team and uh, just amazing to see how much energy they had <laughs> uh, but the coaches were just so so grateful that uh, the church provides the space for them Yes. Uh, one of the coaches says that he's been practicing there 10 years. I mean, that is just fantastic. And you know, one thing we could do is we, I would just like to encourage everyone in the church, if you're driving by and you see a team practicing or yes. just go out of your way and go up and say, 
hi, I'm a member of this church, and we're so glad you're here. And then find out about them. Find yes. out, you know, about their team and, and their record and whatever they'll tell you. They Just were, welcome them. They were yeah. thrilled to see us last night. They He's, were so happy. That, and that uh, coach that, said it was the first time in 10 years anyone had said hello. So let's change that. Yes. We continue to, to reach out in our community. We continue to reach out in, in many places. And we are able to do that because uh, we're a giving people. And so as we come to this time of giving and sharing our offering, please take time uh, to, to either send your, your gift to the church, drop it off at the church office, give online, but let us continue to, to just give to the Lord and see how He changes lives through, through the work of our congregation. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Money. How are believers supposed to feel about this? There's one view I've heard my whole life that says, well, it's evil. And it will lead you to sin and darkness and depravity. Like it's so dangerous and evil that it will taint you. It will take your soul away. Just money, just even, you know, being too close to it. And, and it follows then if you hold this view that money is evil, then 
people who have it, the rich, people who have a nice car or a nice house or nice clothing, well, they're not getting it because if they were getting it, they would have sold everything they have and they would be living piously, faithfully on the streets. And people who hold to this view that money is evil and so are people who have it would say, well, you know, Jesus said it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to get into heaven. You know, they'd say, well, Jesus commended the, the widow who gave the last bit of money she had and Jesus himself, they'd say, you know, he didn't have a home. So there's no room for people who are wealthy in God's kingdom. But they're forgetting about Abraham, right? the father of our faith, who was wealthy when God called him and got even more so as time went on. Like under faithfulness and righteousness became mightily wealthy. Or people like David and Joseph who were at the bottom of their family and went through ups and downs, but eventually rose to these, not just positions of power, but positions of wealth and influence, right? That rivaled everybody else in their countries. So maybe this isn't the entirety of what the Bible has to say about money. Well, then go to the other side. Because I've also heard people say, well, money is not evil. It is a blessing from the Lord. It is a sign of God's favor. And the more faithful you are, the more money you'll have, right? That if, if you really are getting it, then you're going to be the wealthiest among us. And I've heard preachers after a hurricane tell people who had lost everything, well, if you lost your house, that's because God wants to give you a better house. And if you lost your car, if it got flooded in that hurricane, that's because God wants to give you a better car. And this turns God into some ATM machine, right? Like put in the faithful password and the money should come out. And these folks are remembering Abraham and Joseph and David and so many others, but they're forgetting the widow and the poor that Jesus said were blessed. They're forgetting how Jesus didn't have a home, how the disciples left everything, jobs and families and houses to follow. They're forgetting the call to sacrifice. And as you can see, neither of these positions about money, either that money is evil um, or money is, man, God is an ATM machine and faithfulness is the pen. Neither of these is the fullness of what the Bible has to say. These are both wrong. So first let's correct um, that very common uh, misquoting of scripture that I hear, that money is the root of all evil. Right? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of evil, right? And that in chasing money, we pierce ourselves with sorrows, right? The love of money, not money. Friends, money is a tool. It is nothing more than a tool. It doesn't need our love. It doesn't need our trust. It doesn't need our fear, right? That's all to God. Love, trust, holy fear, those go to God. And then God teaches us how to use money as a tool, as a tool to help us, which is not bad, right? And as a tool to make the world a better place. Money is not evil. Loving it is. Money is a tool. And throughout time, believers have tried to figure out what is it that God would have me do with money, especially because money can be so stressful. And financial woes are one of the most common problems we have faced throughout time, right? Whether our finances are paper currency or gold coins, or it's how many oxen or sheep or goats we have. There have always, there's always been this anxiety, right? And a concern from God's children about how do we use this to honor you and how do we take care, right? How do we um, be good caretakers, not just for what we have, but for our families and those you've entrusted to us and the world. 
And so John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church, was a clergyman in England in the 1700s. And he set about to answer this question. Now, a little background on Wesley, which I hope makes you love him as much as a lot of us do. Wesley was an Anglican Church of England clergyman who realized that his class, his um, society had become really stratified based on class. So there was a wealthy, sometimes um, nobled or titled or landed uh, elite and no middle class, very little middle class, and then just so many people who were desperately poor, the working class. And what was worse for Wesley, and I think for all of us, we would say, was that the wealthy held control over the church and they kept it for themselves. And the poor were excluded because they smelled bad and they, they just weren't up to snuff. And so the wealthy got to go into God's house and the poor were shut out. And John Wesley looked at that and he tried to get his church to welcome the poor. And when they wouldn't do it, he kept leading their services. And then in his off time, he'd go out to the marketplace and he'd go out to the um, tavern and he'd go out outside the mine and he would stand anywhere people were and proclaim the good news that God loved them, that life could be different, that they had a savior, just Imagine this little clergyman preaching to these crowds of people who have never heard that God is for them, right? That God loves the poor too and telling them life can be different. And across the nation of England, there was this revival and this spiritual uplift and all these thousands of people came to faith. And then there's lay people on horseback and they're riding all over the country and John Wesley is too and he's got some preachers and and there's this huge spiritual revival. And the people are hungry. They didn't go to Sunday school as kids. They didn't learn what the Bible said. So they're opening their Bibles for the first time or they're listening if they can't read, right? And they're saying, what does God have to teach us about how to be a parent, a spouse, how to be good with our money, like all the practical stuff, right? How to forgive, all this. Well, one of the things that they most desperately needed was financial help because they were desperately poor. So John Wesley goes and looks at the entirety of the Bible. What does God say, Old and New Testament, about money and about how we are supposed to relate to it, right? Like, what is it? And how do we use this tool the best we can? And he comes up with three things that summarize God's teaching on money. Earn all you can save all you can and give all you can. These three things sum up what God has to say to us, to his followers about money. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. So let's talk about them and let's start today with that first one, one that you don't often hear in churches, earn all you can. So John Wesley began as he read the Bible and he realized God's people work. We are hard workers. This is part of our nature and it's not part of our sinful nature, right? It's part of our nature that mirrors God. Like we're created in God's image and part of that image is we were designed to work, to fulfill a calling right? And he knew that because in the first week, right? In the first chapters of Genesis, before sin and darkness and pain have entered the earth, right? Through humanity's fall, you have a creation that's perfect. And part of that perfect creation is work. To me, this is just so incredible and so liberating that work didn't come about when sin entered the world. Like, well, now, you know, you were just sitting around eating grapes and now sin is in the world and so you have to work. No, when God created us and Adam and Eve are in the garden the very first day, right? The, their first day, he's like, take care of this. Right? Watch over it. Help it to flourish. 
help it to thrive, right? You have, you're the caretakers over everything I've made. The plants and the animals and the fish and the oceans and everything, it's under your care. That's a job. And how liberating to think that all of us have within us this calling, this original calling that we have a piece of God's nature within us, right? We're made in God's image. And part of that is we have intelligence and we have gifts and we have passion and skills that are meant to be put to use in a job to care for a piece of this creation. Um, so what about you? Right? What is your calling? John Wesley says that when we find that calling, um, then we do these things. Okay. He says it's the bounden duty of all who are engaged in worldly business, your calling, to observe that first and great rule of Christian wisdom with respect to money. The first rule, earn all you can. Earn all you can. Be set free, right? Earn all you can without guilt or without, you know, grief. We'll talk about caveats, right? But don't feel bad. Like this is who God created us to be. Earn all you can by honest, honest industry. Use all possible diligence in your calling, which is your job. Lose no time. If you understand yourself, right? If you understand how God made you, the intellect, the gifts, the skills, the passion that God gave you and your relationship to God, right? That, oh, this is a piece of God's nature. And, and I'm here for this time to look over this piece of creation. If you understand how God has made you and your relationship to God and other people, you know you have no time to spare. If you understand your particular calling as you should, you will have no time that hangs upon your hands because you'll be working. And so the beautiful thing that John Wesley did in, in helping people find that financial freedom, the peace that God would have us uh, experience when it comes to our finance, the first key is that he was saying to them who were in desperate straits, look, don't wait to win the lottery. Don't pray, please God send a miracle. Don't wait for a great aunt you've never heard of to, to pass on and leave you the money that you need to make it. You have the tools in your hands, in your mind, in your heart right now. Those are the gifts that God is giving you to unlock that financial freedom that we all want. And so may this truth that God has created you to work hard and to work well and to succeed may it just set you free okay don't feel guilty i've i've told people this truth before and i find that there's just this smile that breaks over people's faces that like oh i'm honoring god by working well by doing my job well okay whether that's paid or volunteer right but if we can realize that all of us all of our work is a calling and what the Bible says is all of us should work like our boss is Jesus, right? Work, whatever we do, work at it like we're working for Jesus, like he's our supervisor. Um, then that changes our fortunes, that changes our financial state, that can set us free. So here are the caveats, because if you just say, earn all you can, that could turn us into monsters pretty quickly the fullness of what the Bible is teaching is to earn all we can and save all we can, teach our hearts contentment, and then give all we can. And when we're passionate about our callings and we're, we're conscious of contentment and satisfaction in God, and then we're striving towards generosity, we've got that fully rounded view. And we're gonna get to those in the next couple of weeks, but just know that earn all you can, that's not supposed to be just isolation, like don't stop there. Listen and learn the next two caveats, the next two teachings. And then the next thing Wesley said is that we need to realize that God creates a rhythm in ourselves and in life, that in those first days of creation there was work, and then every evening the work would stop and the people would walk in the evening breezes with the Lord. 
they would just enjoy. They would just savor. Um, they would rest. And then every week there was a work week and then there was a day where the working was put aside and the people trusted God and rested fully and completely. And so John Wesley would say, look, you know, earn all you can, but not at the cost of your soul, not at the cost of your health, not at the cost of your mental capacity or your relationships with your family. Like, yes, earn all you can, but don't, don't sacrifice the things that God, the gifts that God has given you, right? Your health, your life, your, your mental state, the people that you love, don't sacrifice that. And then John Wesley said, you know, but you also can't abuse other people while you're earning all you can. We earn all we can with integrity as believers in Jesus Christ, who taught us to love our neighbors like we love ourselves. And so there's some things in business, you guys, that Christians will never do. Even if it's common practice and everybody else is doing it and it's financially costly for you not to go along with everybody else, don't go along. We are held to a higher standard, and that's the standard of Jesus. He's our boss, not the boss in the world. But then once we do that, once we say, okay, well, I'm not going to sacrifice or compromise my health or the health of another person or my relationships, um, and I'm going to remember that there's a contentment component and a generosity component to what God is asking, well, then we can just be set free. Be set free that there's a calling on your life, a holy and beautiful calling, and that you're honoring God by living it out and it can change the story in your life financially. And that's what happened to people in Wesley's day. That John Wesley, remember, was, was ministering to the very poorest of the poor. And historians say it's because of his ministry, because of the Methodist revival, that England was spared from the kind of deep class upheaval that swept through the rest of Europe, especially France, you know, with the guillotine, guillotining the, the nobility at that same time. Why didn't England go through that? Because John Wesley was teaching them how God would help change their futures, right? Could help redeem and restore and rebuild. And so I wanna leave you today with some of John Wesley's words. And may they encourage you as, as we seek financial peace and as we seek financial freedom, that the first step of that is just to, to see our jobs and our work as a calling and to know that God has given us the gifts and the skills to find the freedom we've always been longing for. So Wesley says, earn all you can by common sense and by using in your business all the understanding that God has given you. It's amazing to observe how few do this, how many people run on the same dull track with their forefathers. But whatever they do, who don't know God, this is no rule for you. It's a shame for a Christian not to improve upon those, right, those folks, in whatever they take in hand. You should be continually learning from experience of others or from your own experience, reading and reflection to do everything you have to do better today than you did yesterday. And see to it you practice whatever you learn, that you may make the best of all that is in your hands. God has put in your hands some gifts and some skills and some intellect that are in no one else in this world's hands. God has trusted you with a little bit of this creation. And you should use everything that God has given you in your work to make this world and its systems and everything about it a better place. Knowing that as you do that, as you care for your little piece, it changes your world. It changes your family's world. That the first way we find freedom in our finances, the first way we learn to use money as a tool is simply to see our jobs as a calling and to earn all we can. Love endures forever
skills, our calling. That is our job. So may you go out with passion and with joy and with hope to fulfill that calling so that you can earn all you can. Amen. Oh, yeah. 